may as well. Yeah. It's going to be recording you. Now I <laughs> with, have with a small fine. me. Yeah. And I don't know why I've got an extra picture of you in the corner. I'm getting rid of that. Oh, that's probably call recorder, but it is recording. So uh -huh. um, at least it's telling me it's recording, and I've got a stop button. All the levels are right. So. Okay. Okay. And at I'll, a, I'll at a minimum, I'll have a video of you with a minimal me uh, right. in the top corner. That's yeah. it. That's it. And you know, from a, Buddhist, from a Buddhist perspective, that's a very fine thing. A minimal me. That, that's actually a good name for a book. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't, don't steal it. Let's mm. cut this out of the recording. Well, actually, here's something. <laughs> we had an idea this morning for a book that I am going to write. And this is, it's, it's, it's so simple. It's so unexceptional. It's so unspecial that it's special. It's called Be More Human. Huh. Now, let me just talk about this a little bit because it, there's a very funny story attached to it. Olivia, we were thinking of, I've been, mentioned this on a couple of recent podcasts, so if I'm boring um, listeners who've listened to other podcasts, too bad. Um, well, that, that includes me, Kit, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> Thank you. I'll start blazing over and you'll have a, a live well, response. <laughs> well, please do. That's great. Um, so I mentioned on one of the recent podcasts that Olivia and I were contemplating working with a particular teacher and she had a, a what I call a moment of perfect clarity or, or an MPC and she said, I'm only interested in practices that will help me become a better human being. And I, when I heard that, it absolutely struck me, um, you know, with the force of a, re of a revelation. But when I spoke to my ex-apprentice, Dave Wardman, you know Dave well, um, he said, what does that mean? And mm. I wrote back to him very sternly and I said, everyone knows what that means. That's just the mind playing with you. Mm. Be a better human being. Everyone knows what that means, even if it's really hard to put into words. And that is something that is worth exploring, I think, just what it means to be a better human being. But anyway, thank you for asking me to do a podcast with you. And the reason we've decided, Tom and I am talking to the audience now, and Tom and I have decided we are doing a split screen presentation is because I intend to ask you as many questions as you're going to ask me. Well, that's the intention anyhow. But Olivia is probably cracking up in the background thinking, that, <laughs> no, this guy just can't stop talking. Well, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate that I can. I'm stop talking now. You know, kid, I think you and I both have the same tendency <laughs> where we're continually promising that we're about to finish a sentence or a, or a thought and then never finishing them. And, well, because everyone uh, leads to another one, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I, I, um, I did write down a few things, but I don't know that they're necessary. I think we have plenty to talk about and I don't need hmm. notes to talk from. But I did note that down. Oh, okay, become a better human being. And I do think everyone knows and perhaps the, the faculty we have for that is the conscience, right? That 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 kind of nudge that you get, ah, oh, you're not, you're not doing the right thing, and this, although although of course, and maybe this is why you've raised your hand, is uh, that can be thwarted, or we can change our conscience, right? We can mm. condition our conscience to to feed us different messages. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it's not the most reliable uh, voice, but it can become it can become that. I think. But yeah, what would you say? I mean, well, for the for the first for. The first comment I would say, conscience is a very Western idea. And this is, and I know we have talked off camera about um, various events that have happened in both of our lives that have led us to our present state of awareness, whatever that is. But conscience, or I think Freud called the conscience the super ego, didn't he? he it's, the, it's the parents or the stern voice that sits above and behind your right shoulder um, commenting on the things that you're doing or contemplating doing and then deciding whether or not that's a good thing. Right. But, it's but, like an, sorry. No, go on. Sorry. It's like an internalized version of culture. That's right? exactly what it is. And, mm -hmm. or, and even worse, it can be is an internalized version of you. And so in many ways, a lot of Western people are fundamentally schizophrenic, I believe. And I'm, and I, and so we have to be very cautious about listening to our own inner voice because unless that is modified or perhaps modified is not quite the right word, unless that is situated somehow in a larger collective voice, it can definitely lead you astray as anyone who's got drunk and done something destructive or stupid knows. And incidentally, that brings me to the fifth precept. The, um, when, I, when I teach in the, the monastery that I have taught in, um, in Asia, as a teacher, you have to live and behave like 
the monks in that monastery. And the fifth precept is, well, it's normally translated as avoid intoxicants, but it, the the more precise translation, and for me, the far more interesting and far more, or the one that speaks of far more possibilities in terms of internal exploration is avoid the heedlessness caused by intoxicants. That is a far more powerful idea. And what I mean is that in the West, we tend to just blanket pr proscribe this or ban that or it's so simplistic it's just a knife that goes in and cuts two things in half and we'll talk about that a little later too probably because that is the mind's first operation and mm -hmm. you asked me off camera what led me away from my philosophy and, and logic studies to the things that i'm more interested in now and that's one of one of those things the fact that logic can't model changes in time that is mm -hmm. a profoundly important thing we'll talk about that in a, another time though but so so now getting back to that first comment on your comment is rather than allowing your conscience to dictate or prescribe your actions or comment on your actions, far better in my view to be connected to your heart center. Mm -hmm. Now this is such a foreign idea in the West, but it's absolutely fundamental in all spiritual schools, all spiritual schools, regardless of whether they're um, North American Indian or whether they're um, a Buddhist or whether they're Jain or whether they're you know, Sufi, there's no difference. They all talk about reconnecting to your heart center. Now to a Westerner, and possibly to some of our audience, they might well ask, what does that actually mean, connecting to your heart center? And that's a very mind-centered question, if I may comment. But, but, it, but in our culture, because science is the, the subtext or the dialogue of our culture, regardless of whether people actually understand science well or not. And certainly so many commentators actually don't have a really good handle on the limits to scientific knowledge, which was what my PhD research was on. Um, it, it, it becomes a rod to beat people over the head with, if, 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 if you know what I mean. And so sometimes a, 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 a modest understanding of science can be more or can do more harm than good. So anyway, what do I mean by connection to the heart center? Well, many cultures speak about, or and we, in fact, in the West here also talk about a gut feeling about something. Now, can our guts lead us astray? Well, definitely, our, our gut can lead us astray, yes. But the difference is, and I think this is a big difference, is that logic and mental processing don't play a part in the gut being led astray. That's in, they're actually separate systems, at least in my experience. And I've, as a meditator, I've spent an enormously long time, thousands and thousands of hours, trying to see and to feel these things pre-verbally, if I can say that. I, I, of course, I'm talking, so nothing that I will be saying will be pre-verbal, but this is the important thing to consider, at least. What would, And this is actually what really led me back to Zen studies after a long period of time away from it, I realized that, and this is also a central part of being a better human being, I wanted to experience reality directly. Now, people will talk about this. It's a common thing to be spoken about, but my, and it might sound, a, it, this might sound like a very critical assessment of my fellow human beings, but in my experience of many human beings, I think it's common that people are not interacting with reality directly. They're interacting with a model of reality that literally exists between their ears. And this is one of the greatest sources of conflict and problems between human beings because we assume that the way we see things, the things that we hold dear, the things that we don't value, and all the other things that come from dividing the universe in half, the half that we want and the half that we don't want, However, that axis is configured, and this is the mind's first act, in fact, but we'll, we'll come back to this, I hope. The fact is, the human being that you're talking to or interacting with doesn't see the world the same way as you do. And this can be at a gross scale, of course, if people are arguing with each other. That's a perfect example of a gross, you know, detachment, if I can put it that way. Um, and in fact, when both people are angry, neither neither is seeing reality in any way clearly at all. But we will, as our anger fuels itself, and I know at least anger used to be a real problem for me personally, it isn't so much anymore. 
But normally when the anger is running hard, there is the certainty that the perspective is accurate. Mm. Now, and that's immensely dangerous because anger fuels us with energy and a whole bunch of other things. It also makes us immensely destructive, can make us immensely destructive. So for the, for the it's very interesting and, and it's a long way around to, to making the final point, but the word Nibbana in Pali or Nirvana in Sanskrit, however it's properly pronounced in Sanskrit and I don't really know a lot of Sanskrit, it actually means a cooling. So the word for enlightenment doesn't mean the things that most people that have no meditation practice or don't really understand a great deal about the Buddha's worldview would not see anything attractive in the idea of cooling. But that's actually what it means, cooling and finally extinguishing. And what, what he was talking about, at least as I understand it, is this idea of not detaching yourself from what's going on around you, but rather they describe it as non-attachment. So the capacity to be a witness, if you like, while actually being involved. If, if that makes any kind of sense. What I mean is that as soon as you remove yourself even partly from the heat and the passion of a particular exchange, and I always use negative examples when I'm talking about this kind of thing because they're so much easier to understand. Everyone, everyone understands that, everyone gets that. A fight with your girlfriend or a fight with your boyfriend or, or worse, your parents, you know. Yeah. Everyone gets that. That's when a certain non-attachment to the process can be immensely helpful and immensely useful and i personally have found that very helpful in my own life i remember yeah, i was sorry you say something and then I'll... i was i was hoping we would talk about that because i've had a similar i was also i would say very angry easy to anger by nature but then i think i have a similar experience to you when i met you my the thing that i was struck most by you is i could see your anger and I don't mean that in a negative way. God, there are so many, you have so many brilliant qualities too. But I could see that you were working with it. Mm. That's powerful. Um, yep. Anyway, go on, please. I was hoping we would talk about, well, I had a question in mind, which was at what point, or was there a, an experience you had specifically that made you realize that? that you, your mind couldn't solve all your problems for you um, was there a moment or is it a gradual was it i'm sure i mean you can have an epiphany and then do nothing with it right and then it's nothing so of course it's always ongoing but and in fact that's a really telling comment and then i'll come back to to answering your comment because the the major i i wouldn't like to put a, a number on it. i started to say the majority I, let's not say that many spiritual schools in fact, based on the founder of that school having had an epiphany of some sort, mm -hmm. sometimes they can be experienced as life changing, but they don't on they don't keep on doing the work. And so, and so two things happen here. One is that there's a certain righteousness and a certain certainty about the point of view of the, of the person who's doing the teaching. And secondly, the path that led them to that epiphany will be and promulgated as the this is the this is what this school teaches and this is how you shall do it but in my own experience and i have been truly blessed to work in a number of different traditions i can tell you um, all paths lead to rome is that famous latin saying used to say and by that i mean it doesn't matter which path you choose if you've got a good teacher your own self will be reflected to you back to you so that you can actually see it clearly and so the moment that I had, and I've kept on working because like the Taoists, we just don't believe in you have an epiphany and, you know, okay, I can kick back now, I can sit back mm. and smoke a cigar. Not that I wouldn't mind smoking a cigar or have a cognac. Mm. Um, the job is done. No, in, a, in all the traditions that I have worked with, the job is never done. It is simply that if you have any success in the approach at all, it is simply that you see a bit more clearly and you function in normal daily life uh, more present more often. But uh, I, li I like to say that my name's not Padma Sambhava and I, d I wasn't born on a lotus leaf floating down that famous river in India um, who came into the world fully enlightened. And there are such people. 
or well, even the Buddha didn't come into the world fully enlightened. He was a householder, as you know, before he went on his long trek. Anyway, you asked me about a moment. Here is the moment for me. And I've seen this so clearly so many times since then too. And that is, we, each of us, now I'll talk about my personal epiphany first and then I'll, I'll talk about the larger context which everyone I hope can relate to. The fact is, if you have the experience of seeing the shape of your own mind clearly, it will be shocking to you mm. and not in a good way. Mm. I remember I was working with a teacher and we were in the kitchen of my house and I suddenly saw that it's so hard to put this into words, but each, like I'll, t I'll say it from my perspective, then I'll try and broaden the perspective. I realized in that moment that I cannot not see the world through my own filter. I saw that clearly. Now you might ask, well, what perspective, this is a typical Western logical question, what perspective was that seen from? And that's a very good question, and perhaps we can come back to that. Hmm. But uh, there's a very famous mathematician and logician called G. Spencer Brown. I don't know whether you've heard of him, but to me, a genuine genius. He wrote a, a small, immensely dense, simple but profound book called The Laws of Form. Mm -hmm. It was a calculus that is designed to allow all calculuses to be understood. So absolutely brilliant uh, mathematician, this guy. But also he was a famous economist as well. He was a true polymath and he, his work is definitely worth delving into in my opinion. But in a footnote in the preface of his book, the most profound thing that I have ever read was written. And what's more, it is literally the Buddha's starting place in his own system. And what he wrote was, what G. Spencer Brown wrote was, a universe comes into being the instant a distinction is made full stop. Now that's not profound. The next bit is profound. All distinctions are motivated. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. here's the thing. Each of us carves the universe into the half that we want and the half we don't want. And the axis of that carving is the particular shape of the filter that you come into this world with. So for me, and I suspect for you as well, I'm just going to get a blanket, I'm starting to get cold here. The, the filter for me personally is right and wrong, should and shouldn't. What is my obligation here, et cetera, et cetera, it's that kind of perspective. And the response in the body is anger. And if you dig into your anger, and I don't know the, the, the shape of your anger, but it is that something is not right or something is wrong or there is what the Buddha would describe as there's a profound unsatisfactoriness about the situation you find yourself in. But here is the interesting thing. Once you understand this stuff deeply enough, you'll see that someone else who does not have this particular filter in exactly the same situation will have a different internal response. And I'm sure you and Ben, for example, your brother, you're completely different personalities, just as my own brother and I are. And th that realization or that comment that I just made would have been something that you have experienced yourself in your life with Ben many times, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I had a early on. It's just funny how these things come to you in different ways, right? Like for me, the first experience of noticing how much my perspective on things changed things and was motivated and whatnot was uh, working as a door-to-door -door fundraiser when I was 17, which Ben had been doing yep. and encouraged me to do. And you just get immediate feedback at every single door, immediate feedback about how you're on how you're presenting yourself and how you're seeing things. And it was kind of a profound, when I think back on it now, and my boss at the time is now a spiritual teacher himself, which doesn't surprise me, quite a profound experience to before each door reset and try to, because this is the other thing is perhaps we're trying to view things more neutrally as they are, as you said, and I, I'm not. 
more directly, if I may say, because more mutual directly. itself um, suggests a standpoint, doesn't it? A perspective already. Right, right. So, and... so what, what I'm trying to say, and it's so hard to put this in words, so please don't feel that I'm criticizing you for using those words because that they're, they're such blunt tools and they're the only ones that we have, right? Mm -hmm. But what I mean by experiencing things directly, and, and I will, I, please do continue, is to experience things with no filter in between. That is to say, the perspective or the shape of the mind, or I like to say the furniture, where the furniture in your mind is organized, where that is actually no longer part of the process of apprehension, that you can experience reality directly. For me, when I first heard that um, proposed as a goal, I thought, fuck, what could be more, what could be more important than that? Right. Right. Anyway, so please go on. Well, and we spoke briefly before. I'm not certain that I've had that experience, or at least I'm having it, I'm having it consistently, because my process to this point has been one of trying to condition myself to view things differently. So it's like the 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 piece of clay is the lens, and I'm molding that lens in a different, the example I've been using a little bit recently is if you walk down the street through the neighborhood and you see someone, what's the immediate effective response? Not what's your first thought, but what's your first feeling upon seeing them? Is it a stranger threat or is it some kind of neutral feeling or is it, oh, this could be a, an opportunity for an interaction, a positive interaction an op an openness to what could be, um, and that's the sort of thing that I've been working to to try to develop to recondition that lens in a more positive direction. Um, I'm not sure whether, yeah, you might be able to share some tools for trying to experience things more directly, as you say, or without without a filter. Uh, but definitely, my whole um, journey <laughs> has been one of playing with trying to transform the the lens the lens itself and that realization came partly through those you know through this door-to-door -door fundraising experience you would have an entire day of no no successes and then four successes in a row it was just clear that whatever was however you were seeing things was so compelling that the other person was seeing them the same way um whether that was good or, or bad mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but then also in my studies as well as you know i studied philosophy too and I was studying affect. What 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 effect does seeing? Because the seeing is in the same moment as the as that demarcation that you're talking about, right? That happens simultaneously. I smell the coffee, and in the same moment, I feel like drinking coffee. Mm -hmm. And in the same moment, I've decided to drink coffee. Well, and here's, then this is very very the, the, what you've brought up the point about affect and look, look for our listeners let uh, affect is a very technical word so let's just yeah. let's just unpack it a bit firstly it's a very important word in psychology and psychiatry but but at it at its root as i understand it it means emotional response affect rather than um, some cognitive response, which and that's mm. not to say that affect can't drive cognitive response either. So let's just talk about this a little bit. This, we, there's a, a little mind game, a little thought experiment. We philosophers love words like that. Gedanken, it, it is in German. A thought experiment that I talk about on workshops to get this point across in a, in a, a very efficient way. So let me just do that now. Let's say you're at home with your loved one. You've had a glass of wine. Now there's a romantic mood in the air and the phone rings and so the phone ringing that has no impact on the romantic mood you're carrying this mood with you you walk over to the phone you pick up the phone and in an instant the instant of hearing the voice and this is it's this is worth slowing time down if we can to really unpack what happens here in as soon as you lift the phone to your ear, my, in my story, it's always an old-fashioned phone that, you know, rings. A ring, a phone that rings. It doesn't have a rotary dial, but it's actually a landline. Mm -hmm. Pick up the phone, and suddenly you become aware it's the hated father-in-law. 
Now what actually happened in the instant of the apprehension of that sound, and in, in the Buddhist perspective on the six senses or the five senses, our mind reaches out to apprehend that particular flavor of stimulus. It, it doesn't come to us. There is a state that you can come to where things come into you, but normally the mind reaches out. And you, be, you become aware that it's the hated father-in-law. Not only that, well, that will come to the next bit in a second, but what happens in the instant of experiencing the hated father-in-law's voice is that your body literally reorganizes itself internally into hated father-in-law mode. Your entire internal structure and your physical, perhaps you have angry, really angry feelings about this father-in-law as well, um, and your whole body will manifest that. And how long does that take? A split second. It literally happens before you know it. That's how people describe it. This, but listen to the words. Before I knew it, because mm -hmm. knowing is a mental process. Mm. This, is, this is really important because these things and all the things that cause people problems in their relationships, they all happen like that. And this is, you, you mentioned before, and I'll just tie that detail up. The more you can be connected to your own internal state, like your heartbeat or your breath or whatever it is that you're using to connect to your physical state, automatically there is a pause built in. Hmm. You and, and if you're talking about the witnessing or experiencing, not witnessing now, but actually physically experiencing the body organizing itself into hated father-in-law mode, that is a visceral response. It actually happens in your internal organs firstly, and then as your mind reflects on it, the surface musculature. If you watch this stuff closely, that's how it happens. Mm -hmm. And so there was a very famous paper, I think in 1970, written by a guy called Zajonk, Z-A-J-O-N-C from memory, does affect precede cognition? Well, you know, to anyone that does my kind of work or your kind of work, that's such a stupid question. Of course it precedes right. cognition. Right. But that debate went on in psychology and psychiatry for over 20 years. It's one of the mm. most cited papers on the, in that field. Mm. And that's because, unfortunately, and this will be my recommendation now to anyone who's contemplating an academic career, you must do body work. You must mm. get into your own body. And look... The reason, I mean, there's many reasons why I decided not to go on with an academic career, and I'd love to know your reasons, but here's one thought experiment for people to think of or consider. What does the word academic conjure up to you? Well, it's some crusty old guy bent over like this, hunched over with that academic stoop and the head forward posture and looking angry or concerned or something. But anyway, the furthest that you can imagine from being open, happy and relaxed. You know, of course I'm doing great violence to many academics that I know who are happy, open and relaxed. But you know what I mean? We even talk about the academic stoop. Mm -hmm. That is part of our language. Anyway, yeah, that so, was so, that, that was my definitely my uh, realization at the end of and I'm still interested in study, but I was studying affect and, just, and another way to think about it is how do things affect you? How are you affected by something? Mm -hmm. um, if people are trying to remember the term, you know, Mm. And I was studying some kind of second wave Marxist talking about revolution and that it must happen through the revolution of the individual. And actually, I found that compelling, you know, this this idea of a transformation of consciousness needing to happen, needing to take place for any sort of transformation to take place, whether it's going to be revolutionary or not. Is, you know, I'm less excited about that now than I was at the time. Yes. But, but there were no tools for, okay, so how do I, how do I have that happen? How do I transform the way I'm affected by things? Well, this uh, is, if, this if that's plays, going to be there. This plays directly into what you and I can talk about because we absolutely do have tools for that. And I'm sure you do right. have tools for that too. And, and so rather than, let's put a marker in here, a mental marker mm. that we are going to come back to this point. What are the tools for self-transformation? Because there are many and they are yeah. available. Yeah. But let's get back to G. Spencer Brown's point just for a second, because this is the, if you like, the where what I'm talking about in my Gedanken about the hated father-in-law. I want to just elaborate on that and then I'll come back to G. Spencer Brown. The hated father-in-law thing, you've just realized, holy shit, it's Boris or whatever his name is. And you're, you find yourself in, you know, hated Boris mode. But here's the thing. 
Cognitively, you know that Boris is actually in an insane asylum in Reykjavik, so in Iceland, so 5,000 odd miles away more, and there's no chance of him ever being released. This is the point. And there's actually no, Boris has zero capacity to hurt you. Hmm. Boris has zero capacity to hurt anyone you love. That does not change what happens in the body. So, we can have a thought about something and the body will organize itself around that thought. And so we can say in that sense, it's a perfect example of affect preceding cognition, but it can go the other way, as you know. You can be thinking about something, you can get, for example, I don't know, the last polar bears, um, that, that video that was going around the net recently about some starving polar bear on a tiny ice floe um, in the Arctic, starving, you know, for all the reasons that we know about. You could that would that could move you massively. So a thought about something that has been triggered by something you've read can cause that same affective response in the body. So it goes both ways. Now let's talk about oh, firstly D. Spencer Brown. Well, his point about things are distinguished on the basis of a perception of difference in value. That's not exactly how he said it, but I'm just unpacking it a bit more. What do I mean by that? Well, you used the example of looking out the window a few minutes ago. And this for me, understanding this clearly and experiencing this clearly was also another, if you like, plank in that, that thing that has changed me internally. But the structure of your mind, and I'll come back to the inescapability of it in a moment because that's also a profound part of the story, and, and the, it was the it was the inescapability of my own filter that was the thing that shocked me to the core the most deeply. I realized in that moment that I was had with my teacher in the kitchen of my house that there was no way of stepping out of the experience of being me. Mm. This is, there is no, I said, I realized, I said, I said, God, it's everywhere. <laughs> and he just, <laughs> laughed and laughed and laughed but that's it it is everywhere and mm. and the thing is at least it seems to me that so many people who are not happy or who, who find their life unsatisfactory in some aspect and un, un, unsatisfactory doesn't just mean about being unhappy it could be being unfulfilled it could be any of the unwords that we use any of the negative unwords what are the tools? How, how might we step out of, here's I'm going to use some formal Buddhist terms now, how might we step out of the formal thought stream? And the reason I propose that as a question is, as, as I pointed to before, for most people, their experience of reality is this model in between their ears. And so if that's what we're using, if all of our senses, our sight and our smell and our hearing manifest through that, because on, in the Buddhist, I should mention this too, in the Buddhist way of thinking about these things, um, the mind is the sixth sense. And in fact, that tattoo on my forearm that we've talked about before is the first verse of a very famous sutra, which talks about the mind is chief, meaning among the senses, the mind rules the senses. In fact, this is the filter that we're talking about. Nothing less, nothing more. So let me put it in semi-formal terms. The structure of your own mind, everyone now, the structure of your mind literally constrains how and what you can see, how or what you can hear, how or what you can smell, taste and feel. It literally structures it. So if we talk and about... You know and my realization at the end of that degree, my philosophy degree, was that just not even just knowing that isn't enough. You can't just change your mind. <laughs> no, and look, that's such, that is such a good point. Yeah. It's a, here's yeah. here's an analogy from my work. You'll get this. Tom, relax. Right. What's the response? The response? What the fuck? Do, what do you mean? I am relaxed, yeah. right? Yeah. It's such a silly thing to say. Well, no, it's not a silly thing to say because it can bring a moment of awareness about. But the the fact is you will have an affective response to the direction to relax. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is really, really important. In fact, everything that we say, the Buddhists say that every word that you utter just goes out forever, just never stops. It's, and so we, that, that's one of the, the, the reasons why there's this prescription or the suggestion that one should guard one's speech. You know, they're not, 
they're not trivial things. Words and the or the fingers, like that Zen parable of the finger pointing to the moon. The words are like your finger. The the words are. It, it, it's not that somehow words are lesser in relation to the moon. It is that words themselves are incredibly powerful, and sometimes we use them very loosely. And that's what the the the, res, the prescription to guard one's speech is based around. Sometimes we can, and I know that I've done this many times in the past myself. We can hurt the ones we love very much by what we say and and although we we exist in a judeo-christian perspective where one of the the dictums there is um the, the the idea of forgiveness the fact is if you're being ruthlessly honest with yourself you can never take back what you said mm. that's the reality of it mm. and if you have hurt someone it's like uh well now i'm going to in, invoke um Freud's brightest pupil, Reich. It's uh, the, in 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 Japanese. They they talk. They say kizu or sketa, which means you have scratched me. You have a, a scratch has been experienced by me because of you. If I can put it that way, that's that is profound. I think so. We say something, and in in our culture we just say, oh, look, I'm just so I'm so terribly sorry. And the next thing that people will say is, I didn't mean that. And yet the energetic experience of the cruel thing that was said is, Oh fuck yes you did. You absolutely meant it. In fact, I'll go further. What you just said a moment ago, you said in such a way that it would have maximum impact, not minimum mm -hmm. impact. Be honest mm -hmm. with yourself. And I've realized that and it ne it's never truer than when we're angry. Never true. We, and especially if you're intelligent, you'll come up with all sorts of brilliant ways of hurting the people you're among. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that the deep realisation that I had done a lot of damage to a lot of people over the years, it, it doesn't matter whether you do good as well. That, that's actually a separate thing, completely separate thing. But if you have the awareness, if you do realise, as I realise, that I've done a lot of damage to a lot of people, you really want to change yourself. You want to, you want to grasp at whatever might allow change to occur. So to get back to answering that question directly, what tools do we have? I would say for the vast majority of Westerners and the vast majority of people listening to this podcast, the greatest gift you can give to yourself and the technique that allows a stepping out of the thought stream most efficiently is not, not a meditation practice, but a relaxation practice. And the reason I say this, that and the reason that my co-teacher in, in these monasteries in Asia invited me to teach with him is because I know a lot about that stuff. I know a lot about how to have the direct experience of relaxation. And why would that be important to a meditation teacher? Well, you can't even begin the work of meditation until you are relaxed internally. You cannot do it. You are fooling yourself. And in fact, here's a classic We've, I've seen this a thousand, well, not a thousand times, that's an exaggeration. I've seen this a great many times. You'll be sitting in a meditation hall and people have their meditation posture. People can't see this, but I'm, I've got my hand in that sort of classic mudra. Um, and let's say I'm sitting in the Burmese position or however you meditate. And you'll be looking out. The teachers always sit in the front of the hall facing the group that they're working with. And so there'll be 40, 50, or in our case, probably 80 or 90 or 100 people in this hall and they're all sitting meditating in brackets they think this is what's happening you'll see it at least a third of the group at any given time you'll see them they'll have their eyes defocused as the prescription is a soft gaze and their back is nice and straight and they're doing whatever they, they've, they've got their their primary meditation object in their awareness etc etc and then this is what happens you'll see the head just go Doop, like this and that happens every 15, 20 or 30 seconds throughout the hour sit. Person falls asleep, literally, and wakes back up, falls asleep, wakes back up, falls asleep, wakes back up. And then the teacher will, they have a debriefing in most of these types of retreats, so they'll say, so how was that sit? Fantastic. It was so calm. Um, I was so relaxed. I was, I was this, I was that or something else. But the fact is, those people were asleep and awake, asleep and awake, asleep and awake. Now, is that am I being critical here? No, because you have to have that experience. That that experience will inevitably happen to you if you sit for long enough. But here's the thing: it is possible to dream that you're meditating and you're meditating well. 
And then the bigger question is, well, what about now? Am I dreaming now? Am I dreaming that I'm having a conversation with Thomas by Skype? Am I dreaming that or is that actually happening? And now anyone who's had a lucid dream will tell you it's not possible to distinguish between a really strong, clear dream and this reality. How are you going to do that? Anyway, th th that's yet another question. So the reason for developing a relaxation practice for me as a teacher is simply as you relax more, inevitably, and this is not something that you can stop happening, inevitably you will become more aware of your internal processes. And so playing back into your example of the door-to-door the -door thing that you were doing and the awareness of what you were projecting and how that constrained the interaction with that person, etc., etc., the more relaxed you are, and it is perfectly possible to be completely relaxed in normal daily life, although most people don't experience their daily life like that, I, I, can, I can say it is possible to do that, mm. then what happens is what one of my teachers called the development of a second attention occurs. That is to say, you will be aware of what's happening inside your body all the time. And so if you have a kind of Boris from Reykjavik type experience, um, the instant you become aware that your body is changing itself to the mode that you don't or would prefer it not to be in, you take a breath, you let your tummy go completely soft. It only takes a split second to do that. And as soon as you let your tummy go completely soft, can you feel what happens? All of a sudden mm. you're aware of what's happening in your body. You can't avoid that. So if you cognitively and, if I may say, with some uh, discrimination, Viveka, and some will, take a breath in and then breathe out, so they're voluntary actions, and let your tummy go completely soft, all of a sudden you become aware of what's going on in your body. And why is that important? Because if you're an anger type, and that's how I would describe myself, if I'm asleep or I'm too tired or I'm stressed or whatever, then I'll revert to my old filter, my old way of looking at things. Um, the temptation or the not temptation, that's not the right word because that comes with all sorts of religious things. Let's see, the old habit of stepping onto the anger train will remanifest because it's there, it's, it's you. And this is the thing, the idea of transcending your own core self, that's such an amusing thing to me. We, and I'll tell you another story on that. This actually made that point for me. Actually, I'll come to that. I'll do this story now because it, it, will, it will make the point in a different way. I was having a, a long late night conversation with one of my teachers in New Mexico. And we were drinking a very expensive brand of cognac. Um, my teacher liked to have a, a cognac with me every now and again, and I liked to have a cognac with him. And so in an unguarded moment, and I'm sure that was part of the whole thing, you know, how we, can we, how can we bring this wound up tight guy's defences down? Best way by far is to give him a few cognacs. That's what I would mm -hmm. say now. So I said in an unguarded moment, oh God, I'm just looking forward to the time when I'm, I'm not angry all the time. Because I recognised that way back then, this is a real problem for me, and not to mention that for the people around me. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? You should really be very guarded around teachers because they're actually paying attention the whole time. They never fall asleep or very rarely fall asleep. And so I said, well, you know, uh, when you get angry, it feels really horrible inside you and it's damaging to other people. And he said, oh, of course, I know all that. He said, but let me tell you, let me tell you about the time when the great beings walked the earth. And so I'm... I'm fascinated already. I have no idea what he's going to talk about. He said, the rishis, so the people who wrote the Vedas, the rishis spoke about a time much earlier than their time. So probably as far as I can tell, maybe 10 or 15,000 years ago, something like that, where the great beings walked the earth who were angry for the space of two or three heartbeats. And immediately this teacher uttered that idea to me that became my life's goal seriously mm. could i because he went on to say he said look there are schools of detachment as i mentioned before he said the last thing you want to do is to detach yourself from your affective states mm. he said that way it's just another kind of death right dead before you're dead and he said there are schools that teach this 
and they walk around like zombies, not affected by anything. So you don't get the good, you don't get the highs, and you don't get the lows. You don't actually get to experience what life is as a human being, as a real human being, where, he said, you feel everything, but you're not controlled by it. I mean, see, the, the, the mind has this tendency, as, as G. Spencer Brown said, to divide the universe in half. He didn't say this bit, but the, the division based on value for most people, it's the half that I don't want and the half that I do want. So I'm going to reject the half that I don't want and people will talk about negative things and, or else or however their own filter operates, however their own filter cuts the world in half, there'll be the half that they want and the half that they don't want. And so people who say on the Enneagram, for example, who do the point three, they are madly attracted to being successful and they avoid being unsuccessful in any possible way that they can. So there's success and failure. They avoid failure and orient themselves towards success, whatever that means. Although I will say that the Dalai Lama said something recently, which I want to share with our listeners, which is he said the world doesn't need more successful people. Mm. You probably read that same thing. It needs more more lovers, more poets, more, more this, more that, and all the things that we could say are more connected to the heart centre. But anyway, so... When this teacher said to me and voiced the goal of being angry for the space of two or three heartbeats, I realized, and that's, and also too, I was, I had gone over to this particular retreat to pursue or to try and find the state of serenity inside my own body. Now, there was no serenity in my body at, at that age in me, none at all. I was just angry, angry and then not angry, but no serenity. I remember saying to her, what do you mean, serenity? It's just like relaxing. What do you mean, serenity? And this teacher just said to me, well, that's what you've got to find. He said, I can't help you find that. And that also was another one of those moments. So I realized that for me personally, and I'm not saying this is going to be for everyone's path at all, but for me personally, to find serenity in my body, I first had to start with something much more ordinary and quotidian, something which is ever, no one regards as special, and that's the state of relaxation. To be able to let myself be deeply relaxed even when fully awake. And I can say now from my own personal experience that the movement to becoming angry, if you are, if you have part of your awareness centered in your physical body, that capacity to pause and let your tummy go soft means, and I, I don't know whether you've had this experience yourself, but if you can let your whole body relax, you can't actually be angry. Now, for someone who is an anger type to say that, if they've not had that experience, will just seem like the grossest fantasy. What do you mean? That's just impossible. That's a ludicrous idea. I've had people, I've worked with students who've said that to me. And I understand, because if someone had said that to me before I'd seen these things myself, I would have reacted in exactly the same way. So relaxation, but for a particular purpose, for the purpose of experiencing what your body, and I would say your heart center, because your heart center is part of the body, it's not part of the mind. This is a very important thing to, to make clear. If we, and so if we're playing back to the very first thing that we spoke about, which is what makes a good human being, and the, distinguish, the capacity to distinguish between right and wrong in the group that we live in is a fundamental part of that. If you're attached, if you're aware of your heart center or the physical center in your body, the body will always be able to guide you in questions of what's right or what's wrong. Always, at least in my experience. And so that, that alone, it seems to me, would be a reason for pursuing that practice. And then assuming you have developed the capacity to experience relaxation at a deep level, and, and I have to add this because, again, the mind loves to play with these things, what I'm talking about here is not a concept. I'm talking about relaxation as an experience. I mean, I've, I've, I know that when we talk to our students and we suggest that relaxation might be something for them to explore, you can see the mind choose over that idea. It's not the body. It, that word relaxation does not connect with a physical state at this stage of the person's existence. It's an idea like the general agreement on tariff and trade. It, it, it's just... It's an idea. Ideas don't necessarily connect with the being, the human being, at all. 
In fact, if you don't understand something, here's very, again another limit case to test that, that assertion. If you don't understand what a word means and it has no connection to you, right? The extent to which a word can help you, a bit like the finger pointing to the moon, experience the moon is the extent to which a word or a phrase or a series of ideas conjures up some past experience that the body had that you can relate to, right? And so one of the things I wrote when I was a young philosopher was no description or analysis of the chemistry of an orange will tell you anything about the taste of an orange. If you have not had some kind of citrus fruit equivalent experience, none of that shit means anything, Thomas. And I know you know this, it's so clear, but it's really worth coming back to these really basic ideas, I think, because so many of our misdirections and mistakes come from not understanding the basic building blocks of the thought that we're using all the time and which we just believe to be accurate, you know? Very yeah, it's, a, it's as if the thoughts are, there's this space between us where the thoughts are operating, the words are operating, the concepts operate, and either they connect for both of us to some experience we've had or they don't. And in the meantime, if they don't, you're just attempting, and this is a struggle as a te teacher, isn't it? Is you're trying to use words or images or stories that help that other person have the experience. Yes. But experience. I mean, we're having, the, that's having the, the key experience. Thing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And we're having our conceptual ex conversation and we're nodding because we're, the concepts are connecting to yes. experiences, yes. right? So we can, but yeah, that was another, another huge realization for me was that thing of uh, seeing things only through your own lens and experiencing things through only through your own lens. Again, it's like sometimes maybe I'm saying a word, I'm sharing a concept that's connecting with an experience of yours that's actually very different to the experience that I had that I'm tr trying to connect you to with the concept. I, maybe it's not maybe it's not landing at all. <laughs> I guarantee you that is accurate. In fact, Olivia and I had this conversation only yesterday, and I'll just tell you a quick story. We we are we reflect each other to each other all the time. We are she's she is my most important spiritual teacher, and, and in fact in fact good relationships any kind of relationship actually if you pay attention can be the perfect teacher for each of us now something happened and i interpreted the something that happened to mean as something else and she when she told me what her experience was and it was something utterly trivial i can't it's so trivial i can't remember what it was but she told me um, a series of mental steps that she went through, five or six steps to get to a particular position, which actually ended up at a completely different position to the position that I had experienced, literally in a 10 second conversation. This is how powerful and how dangerous potentially these things are. But I realized as soon as she recounted to me the steps that she went through, I thought, that's completely plausible. I understand that completely. And what's more, totally consistent with what actually I recall happened. So there you go. There's two people who live together, right? We're working, living together. And in the space of 10 seconds, you can completely misunderstand the intentions and the reasonings of the other person in 10 seconds. It's, it's volatile stuff. And this really, we, have, we, re, we really have to pay attention. And the, and the whole dictum, in, you hear people saying all the, all the time these days, oh, you, just, you have to be present. Yes, you, well, I mean, that's a great piece of advice. How do you stay present? How? How does that... So this is another question about what tools we can use. And again, I'd say, well, let me run an idea by you and please tell me whether you think this is completely ludicrous or not. But the, the reason I have focused so much in my work on internal states, and that's both true in my meditation practice. My meditation, we'll talk about that another time. It's a more samatha type of practice, not a vipassana type of practice, which is the most popular form of meditation here in the West. But becoming aware of internal states, is the reason is this. I'm just struggling to, to put this into words. I, 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 I'm going to put it just boldly and simply. The body never lies. That's what I'm going to say. And, and of course, that doesn't actually mean a great deal. So let me just elaborate on that. Your mind is lying to you all the time. And by that, I don't mean that to denigrate the operations of the mind. If, if someone is relaxed 
and and their mind is working well then the mind has immense creative potential as well of course that's true when i say your mind is lying to you here's a classic one that we do on workshops all the time we'll say to everyone turn your head slowly as far as you can to the left like this and everyone will come to a stop and then i'll say in the, to the group i'll say so do you feel like you've come to the end of your range of movement? Of course, you can see people nodding or raising their eyebrows up and down because that's exactly what's happened. They've come to the end of their range of movement. And I say, take in a breath. And as you breathe out, turn your head further. And in every case on a workshop, this whole room full of people, everyone turns their head further. Mm. And so I say, and then we do it again. It goes further a third time. So we come back to the, the, the middle. And, we, and then I say this, I say, okay, so... You've just seen an example where your own perception of the end of the range of movement clearly wasn't accurate. Now, with that idea in mind, see what happens when you turn your head to the right. Guess what happens? You come to the end of the range of movement, and when you then tell the class to take in a breath and breathe out and turn the head further, the head goes further. Mm. And that, so there are a number of things here. The body rules, firstly. And secondly, you can't make yourself flexible by just thinking, yes, I'm going to go past this point in the range of movement that I can't go past. I mean, if that was true, both you and I would have been perfectly flexible a long, long, long time ago, right? It doesn't happen like that. It's the... What's the word I'm looking for? It is the separation. That's not quite the right word I'm looking for. But it's the... The space that the body lives in and the disjunct of the space the mind lives in where human beings' problems begin. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let me elaborate on that too. The root of suffering, according to many theories on this, or the Buddha spoke of a particular, a particular one, he made the claim at some point in some sutta that the majority of people... They're, when they're in their heads, or, or I'll take a step back, that's not his, his work. Most of us are interacting with a model of reality, as I said, but there's, there's more to it than that. The model is usually fixated on the past or the future. Mm. So the model will be talking about if it's fixated on the past, people will be regretting something that's happened in the past or talking about the hated father-in-law example, some terrible thing that the hated father-in-law did in the past, nonetheless it brought into the present by the mind and the body, because memories live in the body as well as the mind, as you know. Um, and so if, if that effect is too strong, then we can say that some people are being controlled in the present moment by their constant re-recollection of things in the past, the hurts that were associated with that, or or the regrets in the case of, say, someone who I used to be really flexible and now I'm not flexible, I'm miserable all the time because I used to be flexible, it's like that. Or dreaming about a future which never actually comes, wanting an alternative to what's actually happening right now, and that's that mental division, the half of the universe that I want, the half that I don't want. That division and that reality is in the continuously unfolding present only. It doesn't exist in the past and it doesn't exist in the future. And that's the whole basis of Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, which I recommend is a very good book. So what's the connection to the body? Well, the body, the body its language is not words. The language of the body is sensations, for which we have an extremely poor vocabulary. It's impossible, virtually impossible, to describe physical sensations with words. You, I know you, you're familiar with this idea because you've had difficulties as a teacher yourself trying to explain exactly what it is that you're feeling when you say, well, like when you're trying to teach someone how to do a muscle-up, for example. The capacity to do a muscle up, just like the capacity to do a chin up, is when you put your hands on the bar and the body knows it can do X or Y. The body knows. It's yeah, we have this experience all the time. Of, it's a feeling. It's, it's not feeling. an idea. Yeah. That's the point. You're giving a cue. Oh, open your shoulders. Open your shoulders. About two years later, hey, I think I opened my shoulders today. <laughs> I, I real I discovered something. I needed to open my shoulders. <laughs> and you, you know, and you go, yeah. That's right, head slap. And exactly. Olivia says this all the time. She said, 
she'll say something like, I'll say something on a workshop, or she'll say something on a workshop, and I'll say to her, but darling, I've heard you say that to this person at least five times on this workshop already. That, but, you know, and as teachers, we have to, we just have to laugh about that. And you certainly can't be critical of a student for that, but there's well, something else to think about too. This is really important. Just on a teaching note, so we're making a bit of a segue here, but as a teacher, you can never be irritated or annoyed with your students because they did not understand your direction. Because half the time, if you're saying anything that's even vaguely interesting, they're actually reflecting on something you said a minute or two ago, and they don't. The fact is, with the concentration on that series of ideas, I'm you know percolating around. The conscious or the awareness can't actually hear what you're saying, and we and we've demonstrated this to each other so many times on on workshops. So don't be annoyed. Just repeat. Just repeat. And, and also, remember, it's, it's also not fair because everything you're teaching is an experience you've had. Of course. <laughs> no, so you're already in the position of. And there's that story, and um, I did one one semester on Buddhist philosophy, so I, I'm an expert. You, oh, you're um, a man. I'm, I bow down <laughs> before you. <laughs> but there's that story of, uh, and I'm sure you're more familiar with it than I am, of the raft. You just you take the raft across the river, right from the sh from the banks of yep. ignorance to the shores of enlightenment, yep, and sure. then you're done with the you're done with the raft. Um, again, the concept is they're trying to connect an experience you've had as the teacher to an experience you'd like for the student to have. Um, and I, you're in a you're in an unfair position because you never t you never teach something you don't understand. Of course. And look, I've got a better example, if I may say, than that raft example. Here's a better example, and this is how this is how we can argue for the desirability of of certain processes and certain practices because we treat them as scaffolding. I mean, Alan Watts wrote a book, Be Here Now. Now, and it's a very famous book. If you could be here now, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Be here now. Okay, boom, it's done. Work's done. I'm here now. I'm still here now. I'm still here now. I'm fully present. I'm always fully present. That's not what happens. <laughs> So what we do in terms of trying to take someone or ourselves as well from a state of uh, lesser awareness or lesser presence to greater awareness, greater presence is we use techniques that I'm going to refer to from now on as scaffolding. Mm 